think I'm good. So, uh, yeah, thanks everyone who showed up. I guess there was, there was considerable drinking last night. Yeah. I noticed. Uh, and it is early, so thank you. Um, for those of you I haven't met, my name is Eric Evans. Um, I used to be more heavily involved with OpenNMS many, many years ago. Uh, when I worked for Rackspace, who were we, the second customer, Tars? I did, yeah. Okay, we were kind of the second yeah, customer. Second or third. All right. And, uh, uh, and now I work for the OpenNMS group. It's pretty cool. Um, i also been involved with Debian and more recently uh, Cassandra Project. And uh, I actually had a short stint for a com company here in the UK working on Cassandra before working for the OpenNMS group. Uh, before I get started, <coughs> Uh, the, the, talk, the title of my talk is uh, sort of intentionally provocative, you know, maybe it's a troll. Uh, a lot of us have been using OpenNMS for quite a bit of time, and uh, even if we haven't, you probably used something with RD, so uh, you know, we, we tend to latch onto these things that we're familiar with and we're comfortable with, and so you know, uh, it, it might be somewhat unsettling to hear that I'm suggesting that we use something else, that we do something different after 15 years of, of RD. So the way I figured we could do this is uh, treat it as a five <coughs> stages of grief thing and go through it together. You know, like we, we could all like a family be there for each other as we go through these five stages of grief. And the five stages are denial, anger, bargaining, depression, <coughs> and acceptance. So stage number one, denial. No doubt one or more of you is uh, is doubting that this is absolutely necessary. And uh, I think that just because you're German doesn't necessarily mean that we have to discount your, your opinion. Uh, so let's look at this. RD is also a very old project, uh, also I guess about 15 years old. Stands for Round Robin Database. Um, and it's ostensibly about time series storage, a file-based solution, all constant size, self-maintaining, and it does this incremental <coughs> uh, aggregation. So every value you put in gets aggregated into the, into one of the aggregations you've created. Um, and that's why I say it's ostensibly about time series storage, because what it's really about is graphing. It's all about graphing. Everything starts from the graph and works backward from there. Um, the only reason we're storing aggregations, and actually that's all you can really get out of it is these aggregations, or an RD speak consolidation um, is because that's what we intend to plug directly into the graph. You know, the, the problem you face with the graph is you have some number of pixels in width and you want to plot some time period across that x-axis if you're collecting on five minute intervals and you want to do a year's worth of data and you have 400 pixels in, in, you know, to, to draw on, obviously you need to combine these things. And you also need it normalized so that it aligns on common time boundaries. And that's what those consolidations are. They're the values we expect to plug into the graph. In fact, it's all, you know, like I said, it's the only data you can actually get out of it. So it's really all about graphing. But there's a cost with this automated aggregation, this incremental uh, aggregation. And when I first did this slide, I said, I thought, well, the, you know, the, when I picture the, the number of IOPS this takes, it's a read, modify, write. So you have to read in the RD, and you have to mutate the structure, and then you have to write it back out. And uh, I looked at JRobin, which is a Java implementation of RD, and I looked at least, uh, perhaps I looked at the wrong backing, because I'm told even this, this isn't even true for JRobin. Uh, but thanks to Ronnie, who sent me some, some additional information, it's actually much worse than this. Uh, it's like five plus. It's like five plus how, uh, two times however many RRAs you have <coughs> in terms of random I.O. Um, and so that means that you know that that, that for for any decently sized data set, you know, we're doing thousands or tens of thousands of random IOPS. And to put that into perspective, a 15,000 RPM SAS drive, a nice high-end server hard drive, is probably still not good for much more than than maybe a couple hundred. Which is why people like Mike get SANS and and people put together elaborate RAID arrays. And uh, the point of this slide is that. Uh, you just, we just reached the ceiling in terms of vertical scalability. And you might say, well, we can get an SSD, because SSDs have, have uh, 
you know, have I.O. in this sort of range, but um, this is like the pathological worst case for a flash-based SSD in terms of durability. You know, that you, you probably get a year, uh, maybe even less yeah, out of it. What's that? Four or five months. Okay, four or five months. And uh, you, you, know, you could, uh, could, of course, use a DRAM-based SSD, but those things are crazy expensive. And you know, this vertical scaling works when the hardware, you know, like throwing hardware at the problem is what, you know, is what vertical scalability is, uh, or vertical scaling is. Um, that works well when the hardware that's available to you and the cost you know, can outpace your actual, uh, your actual growth. And this is really no longer the case. Also, you know, not everything is a graph. You know, we'd like to get into other forms of analytics. And, you know, an, an API that's meant to extract data for the purpose of graphing <coughs> spread out across files in the file system is not, not very, you know, the, the most convenient way to get at that. They're also uh, kind of inflexible. Bef before you can store data in an RD, you must first create the data. You, you must know about it ahead of time. So it sort of drives this declarative model we have. Uh, it'd be nice to just receive data and store it without having it predefined up front. And then we've had problems, you know, things that we've tried to solve and haven't come up with good answers for, like incremental backup. Seems like a perfectly reasonable thing to want to do, and yet we haven't been able to come up with a good way just, just because of the nature of, of how it works. So that takes us to the second stage of grief, which is anger. And uh, it would be normal to be a little angry about this because, or frustrated, because this is the age of big data. This is when we care about data more than we ever have in the past. <coughs> we should be collecting more things. We should be thinking about more, uh, more sources of data that we could get. Uh, we should be thinking about collecting more frequently, if that would help. And the you know, Internet of Things is, is upon us. You know, it's, it's promised to be along any time now, and we'll see this explosion in the number of devices we need to to collect from. So this is the wrong time to be having a bottleneck, to be having an issue scaling uh, data storage. So uh, the next stage of grief is bargaining. You know, after we're angry about it, uh, we may try to bargain our way out of it. Can't we just serialize the RRD rights? Can't we just hold on to a few and write them at once and combine the, the I.O.? Yes, we can. Uh, Matt did that years ago, and it's, you know, we're past, and it helped a great deal. It was a, it was a huge win, but we're past that point now, so that's not available to us. But what about caching? It is read modify, right? So certainly we can cache and save on the read, but uh, I suspect that's the only reason we've gotten as far as we have anyway. Uh, the page cache will hold on to these, these RRDs so long as we have enough memory to store our entire data set. But once you run out of memory, then, then you're back where you started from. And this is, again, you know, like a, a vertical scalability issue. It's like you have to grow the amount of memory, and there's a finite limit to that as well. So what about distributing the RRDs? We could take the whole set and shard them and spread them out to different machines. That's getting closer to the right answer, I think, but distributed systems are very, very difficult. There's a lot of little problems to work out there. And uh, before we go trudging off, taking, taking on something like that ourselves, we should consider other projects that have already worked out all these hard problems. Which brings us to depression, the next stage of grief. And I don't know what to say about this except for that we're in England, you know, when in Rome, we should, you know, we should honor our hosts and stiff upper lip, let's be stoic. Mustn't grumble. But mustn't grumble, thank you. And move on to, to acceptance. Uh, yeah, this sucks. It's not a, it's not a, you know, solving it isn't an immediately visible problem unless you have the scal scalability issues. Uh, we also have to replace graphing. Yeah, that's not great either. We have to <coughs> replace graphing because in RD, storage and presentation are very tightly coupled, and if we're not going to store our data in RD, we can't use it for graphing. Uh, but this is what technologists do. We have a problem. We need to solve it. Let's create the technology for it. Uh, this isn't second system syndrome. It's not NIH. You know, we're not reinventing a wheel. Uh, we need to do this. So uh, it's also an opportunity. It's our chance to have uh, a system that's you know, decoupled and distributed. Uh, <coughs> we won't have to have uh, our, our web head running on the same 
machine or, or with a file system available that has the RDs, you know, we can, we can split things up. We can prioritize high throughput. You know, we can fix the scaling problem, basically. Uh, we can make it operationally simple so that scaling just means adding another machine. And uh, since we have to replace graphing, what about making uh, graphs a pluggable JavaScript API so that instead of writing a bunch of obscure uh, escaped property files with RPN, we can instead just write JavaScript. Um, I'd be interested to see what the community comes up with if they can just, you know, plug in their own graph in JavaScript. Um, and this is our chance to facilitate new forms of analytics. You know, we can we can think beyond simply graphing and and, and look at other things we can do with this data. And I'm sure that you know if we we left this slide open for long enough, everybody could just <coughs> fill, up, fill up another two or three with with things that we could do using this op opportunity. So we spent some time looking at what was available and thinking about you know the requirements, uh, you know considering what to use or whether we should write our own. And uh, another number of things came up, but a couple of important observations were that uh, for our use case, we collect and write way, way more than we read. I mean, I think it's probably, you know, I don't have numbers, kind of wish I did, uh, but I think it's, it's probably staggering. I mean, what is it you see when you, you go into a knock? You know, you know there'd be a projector showing a wall board and what, 10 graphs maybe? And how many people, you know, work in your organization, if you sat them in front of a graph, you know, all day long, how much of the data could they possibly view in that, in that period out of the potentially millions of data sources we collect? Uh, yet, with the way the incremental aggregation works, with that, we're, you know, the, the I.O. that we're paying for that read, modify, write, for purposes of having all that aggregated data ready for graph, it's as if we're optimizing for reading every second of every minute of every day of every single data source we collect at least once. Uh, so this is really the wrong trade-off to be making <laughs> to be so heavily read optimized when, uh, when we read so very little of the data. Uh, the other thing is uh, grouping should be a huge win. I actually, again, in my previous misunderstanding of how RD worked internally, I assumed that for, for the I.O. we were expending, uh, storing multiple data sources in a single R.D. would be pure win. Like, you know, that you'd get all of that, those additional rights, uh, basically I.O. free because you'd already spent it on, on opening and reading and writing the file. But that's not true. Uh, so there is a little win in reading, reading, the, reading and writing the headers, the common bits, but you still, the majority of it, we're still t hitting I.O. Uh, but grouping, if it wasn't for the, the what I think is just brokenness in, in the way our RV writes, uh, grouping should be a huge win because how many how many graphs do we put together that only have a single data source on them? I mean, we we graph in and out bytes together, you know, one five and fifteen minute load averages together. You know, <coughs> we tend to collect things together in you know similar metrics that are easily grouped, we collect them together, we write them together, and then we tend to read them together. Uh, and so this, is, uh, this, is, this should be an easy optimization. It should be like a first class feature. Uh, uh, you know, even, even if it's not working out for us when store by group is true in OpenMMS. Uh, so what we ended up doing is we ended up starting our own project. We didn't find anything that really exactly meet, met our needs. And again, if we're going to all of this work, then you know we we need to get what we wanted. Um, we're calling it Newts. We're uh, scoping it as a standalone time series data store. So this does not have collection. It's not make pr any provisions for collection. It does not do any graphing. There's no presentation whatsoever. <coughs> it's just scalable storage, and those other pieces will be other pieces. Uh, prioritizing high throughput, horizontal scalability, and group storage and retrieval. And we're making it late aggregating. So aggregations are not in line with storage of the data. So they, they will not, they're not an impediment to scaling, scaling out. Uh, it's being built on top of Cassandra. For those not familiar, Cassandra is a distributed database, a so-called a NoSQL database, and it's tunably consistent. You may have heard eventually consistent. That's kind of a negative spin on a negative sounding 
uh, where I prefer tunable consistency. And uh, I have a true story. Apparently, I'm the one who came up with the word NoSQL, and uh, that's a story for another time. It's not, it doesn't position me as a thought leader. It's just dumb luck, spouting crap off when I should have kept my mouth shut. Uh, but apparently, I'm the one who coined the term NoSQL. Um, and then, you know, I worked on Cassandra, which is sort of the darling of the NoSQL space. And I introduced CQL, which is basically SQL for Cassandra. So it's kind of like the best troll ever. You know, to create a <laughs> controversial, overly used tech term and then make it confusing and, and no longer applicable. So I prefer to call Cassandra MoSQL instead. Um, so I'll explain a little bit about how Cassandra works so that uh, you can see what a great fit it is for this kind of, of storage. So the way, we, uh, the way we usually talk about this, visualize it, is uh, a like sort of clock face or this ring here. So uh, records are rows that are looked up by keys. So you can think of these keys as being analogous to a primary key in a relational database. Um, and uh, this ring consists of the, uh, the entire you know, key namespace. All possible keys are mapped onto this ring or clock face, with the lowest one starting <coughs> at some point, wrapping around in sorted order to the highest one. Uh, and then you can imagine taking and giving each node in the cluster an ID within that namespace, and hopefully you know, randomly assigned so that they're evenly distributed across there. And so a partition uh, of data is formed by uh, the interval between a node and the one that precedes it counterclockwise on, on, on the ring. So for example, uh, the partition of C in this diagram is made up of the interval between C and B. Any keys which sort between uh, B and C belong to node C. They belong to that partition. Uh, so then storing a value or reading a value is a simple matter of finding where on this namespace your key sorts on and then taking the next node around the, around the ring, working clockwise. Uh, we'd like to replicate data, so we call this we call the first step placement. Uh, we call the second, second step here replication for purposes of redundancy you want and, and to drive the tunable consistency, which I'll get in in a minute, uh, you want to replicate data. So from that, all we need is something that is based on the placement point and that is deterministic. So in the simplest case, we can just take the next n minus 1 nodes working clockwise. Uh, but anything deterministic will work, and so there are, there are strategies for this that take into account uh, racks in the data center and uh, you know, data centers, actually, so that you can uh, spread out your copies across uh, uh, different pieces of, of your infrastructure. Uh, but whenever you're storing multiple copies of, of data in a distributed <coughs> system, uh, there's the potential to, to run afoul of these contentious properties, consistency, availability, and partition tolerance, which, call the, uh, which, is, which are described in the CAP theorem. And uh, it's really not all that complicated. If you think about it, just a simple case of, of replicating data to two servers, you know, whether it's secure copying it or posting some JSON, whatever it is, uh, you could do this asynchronously, you know, copying it to one of the nodes and allowing the other node to then copy it to its, its slave or whatever. Or you can imagine copying it to both of them and verifying that it made it to both of them. So we have synchronous and asynchronous replication. Uh, so if we're doing synchronous replication, then the condition for successful write would be that we successfully wrote it to both nodes. But if one of those nodes fails, then obviously we can't satisfy that condition. And so we've given up availability in the interest of consistency. Uh, likewise, if we, you know, we were using asynchronous replication, then we would only need to write it to one node before we considered that a success, and then count on asynchronous rep replication to copy it to the other nodes. Uh, but if then, then we wouldn't be able to reason about what the consistency of the data was uh, at any given instance in time. So we would have given up consistency for availability which is all this really boils down to. What people usually <coughs> say, though, is pick two. You know, you can have two. You can choose to be consistent or available or, 
available and uh, consistent but with no partition tolerance. And uh, when I said that the tunable consistency was a feature, uh, I'm going to demonstrate here in a little bit why, why, that's, why, why that is by, by showing that it's not simply a matter of picking which two you want. Um, all right, well, I'll show that now. This is why I needed my speaker notes. Um, all right, so imagine we've got three copies of the data. Um, what, what the tunable consistency does is let you choose how much of that will be synchronous or asynchronous. So imagine we have three copies and we do a write at consistency level one. So we're just saying, uh, in order to satisfy this right, I just need to get it under one node, and, and I assume that the others will asynchronously replicate almost immediately. Uh, but all we can reason about is the one node we wrote it to. So even if, they, even if the other two do replicate right away, we could follow it up with a read quickly enough and race to the race <coughs> to old value. So this is why we say we're sacrificing consistency for availability. We can survive two node failures and still make this right, but we can't reason about two, two of the three copies. But if we were to follow that up with a, with a consistency level all, if we were to read from all three, then there's no way we won't find the newest value. Internally, these are all timestamps. So if we were to read A, B, and C, and only A had received the data, and B and C had stale copies, we wouldn't know. And so we would be able to, to read our write, which is all people really care about, I think. Uh, more common is to use quorum consistency, which is a majority. So if we had, again, replication count of three, quorum would be two nodes. Uh, again, we're going to block, we're going to replicate synchronous, synchronously on two nodes. Uh, one, one of them is, is you know, we can't reason about, we can't say for certain that it's up to date. But no matter which two nodes we read, if we, if we follow that up with the a quorum read, we're, we're going to find the most recent value. Uh, and not necessarily important to this algorithm, but in Cassandra, you can read from read or write from any of the nodes, and they'll proxy it to the right location. Um, you don't need to contact multiple nodes. And if a, your, your coordinator node finds a stale value, as I've described, they'll simply give you the right one, and then they'll repair the inconsistency. Uh, but the important takeaway from this is so long as the number of copies you block on for a read and a write are greater than the replication count, you'll always read your write consistency. So in this first case, I could survive two node failures on the write, none on the read. Uh, Dynamo, in, or I mean uh, Amazon in their Dynamo white paper, which is, which is where this algorithm comes from, uh, they say they use this for the shopping cart, that it's absolutely important when customers add something to the shopping cart, that that succeed. But they don't need to reconcile it and make sure that they have <coughs> everything until the, until the checkout but they don't want something to be lost when it's added to the cart. Uh, so that might be you know, where you might want to make that kind of trade-off. In the quorum one, we can survive a single node failure, we can survive a you know, partition, and, uh, and, it, and, have, and have everything you know, be consistent once, we, once the partition is closed. And so this is like a really great feature to work around you know, the, the limitations of, of distributed storage. Right, so what this gives us is, both the, you know, the dis in terms of the distribution and replication, it gives us a system that's symmetrical uh, because you can deterministically you know, find the location uh, of a row without contacting, without any coordination, without contacting a master node or, or a coordinator or something. All of these are the same. All of the nodes are identical, uh, which means it's linearly scalable. Um, with the replication, it's redundant. With the tunable consistency, you know, it's, it's highly available. We can survive node failures, all of which are very good properties for, for what we want for, for our time series storage. Um, and as easy as it is to scale up, to grow the number of machines, and again, it's linearly scalable, so you know, if you have homogeneous nodes and you, you have you know, five of them and you grow it to ten, you literally double your, your throughput uh, you're going to double your storage. As easy it is, as it is to grow horizontally, uh, it's actually, each individual node is actually also write optimized. So the throughput on a single node is still quite good. In fact, it's, it's probably as close to optimal as you can expect. Uh, so the way that works is when a client makes a write to a single node, it's written in two places. It's written to an in-memory structure called a mem table where it's kept sorted. Uh, 
and it's written to a commit log, which is an append-only file that's usually kept on a, on a separate disk. Um, that, that commit log is, is as I said, append-only, so that the disk access is sequential. So we're not using any of that random I.O., it's just, it's just continuous writes, continuous appends. And so, uh, you know, again, even, even low-end uh, storage hardware is really, really fast at this. It's the random I.O. that's a problem. Uh, so when a mem table reaches a threshold, it's flushed to disk in the form of an SS table, uh, typically on another disk, so that we're not, again, there's no contention. And uh, it's only ever written once. These files are immutable, so we, we flush it to disk. The SS table becomes a representation of the mem table. Uh, you know, we have to, of course, merge these SS tables in order to paint the, the full picture of uh, during a read. But it, again, it, it means that the that the disk access is very, is very much sequential. Uh, very little random I.O. Uh, so again, this means that you know, the properties that are interesting to us are that it's optimized for write throughput. Um, and the fact that, that data is persisted in sorted order is also a huge win for us because guess what else is <coughs> sorted? Time. All of our time series data is sorted, sorted by time. Um, so storing it in sorted order is great because we just have to find the point in, in the data where, where the value we're inter interested in begins and then just keep reading until we find, we keep reading sequentially until we find the value, that, you know, the final value that we're interested in. I'll actually get to the data model here in just okay. a second. That's a good question, but I, have, I got it covered, I think. Um, so the uh, high-level view of, of, of NUTS and how it works is that we're storing samples. Samples are, are <coughs> literally a sample of the data, data that's been collected. And, uh, and then you know, we're writing them strictly as is with no processing, and you're able to query them back out exactly the same way. Um, and then you can query for measurements, which are, you know, it's hopefully not stretching the terminology too much. You can query for measurements, which are calculated from the samples. Those are your aggregations, 15-minute you know, averages or, or the like. Uh, and this terminology, you know, if you read the, de the dictionary definitions of sample and measurement, they seem to work out pretty good. I'm still not sure that's the best. It, I still think of sample and measurement as almost being synom synonymous. Uh, but when, when you hear me make that distinction, you know, a sample versus a measurement, a sample is the data that was collected and the measurements are the, the, the computed values for, for a graph, for example. So uh, we do have a REST interface uh, in this slide. <coughs> this, is, this is the actual representation for, JSON representation for a sample. Uh, but on this slide, I'm just mostly wanting to, to describe what, what the structure of the sample is. So it's a timestamp, obviously. It's a resource, which is an arbitrary string, and it and is meant to uh, to denote the group of things. So, for example, this might the resource might be a string constructed to denote a host and you know the MIB2 interfaces and you know, ETH0 or something. Um, you know, something that you might you know something that would represent a group of metrics. Uh, and there's a little onus on on the consumer of this because uh, you could, of course, group a great deal. You could group all the metrics collected from a single host into, into this, and that might not be good. Uh, or you could make it so flat that you didn't take advantage of that. Uh, the name is the name of the metric being collected. So if the resource was, you know, you know rep represented a single interface in the mid, mid two interfaces, mid, on a, on a host, then this would be all of the individual metrics. Uh, Type is the is the is an enum. It's the type. It's a basically it's the same types from RRD. Uh, we use those types in the measurement query interface, the one that does aggregations, to do to handle all the low level conversions to to rate, for example, um, that 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 is it's assumed that we want. And then of course the value is the value. Uh, metric name and value are the, are the important parts. Then I suppose. 
Um, and Cassandra, I went ahead and showed this because this is, I think, valid SQL, and I'm sure there's plenty of people here that, that know enough of SQL. This, this is the DDL for creating the, t the, the table that those samples are, st are stored in. Um, you know, all but the last line are probably really obvious what those do. You know, resources is a text, so it's UTF-8 string. And, uh, you know, the, the timestamp is a timestamp type. And uh, value is a blob. Maybe that requires a little explanation. Uh, since, since depending on the metric type, you know, if metric type is gauge, then, then the values data type is actually double precision floating point. But if, if metric type, for example, were counter, <coughs> that needs to be uh, along. So we store the value as a blob and then marshal the bytes uh, to and from the right data type depending on metric type. Uh, there's this attributes that's not wasn't shown in the JSON representation. That's just an arbitrary set of uh, key value pairs that can be used for anything. So uh, you could use those to, uh, to 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 send information along with a sample that you might later want to to make use of in a graph like units or maybe even event information if you wanted to uh, display a graph that correlated some event or state with you know, some point on the graph, you could add that as an attribute when you submitted the sample. Uh, but the interested, interesting point is probably this last line, this primary key definition, and it kind of starts to get into the answer for your question. Um, in Cassandra, this, uh, this, this represents like a, a cluster, you know, the, the primary key is a cluster of these individual attributes. The first one is the row key. So when I showed that, that the distribution throughout the cluster is determined by the key, that what's, what's, what's called a content addressable system. Uh, the resource, that attribute that, that identifies a group, is the partition key. It's that, the, you know, the, the underlying primary key, if you will. Um, so it means that that all of all of the metrics in a group are stored uh, together in that you know, within that same within that same. This is this is this is. I always struggle to uh, describe this. It's not an easy concept to describe unless you're familiar with Cassandra how it was before. Um, but what happens is these these form a compound key on the underlying data model so that we could bake structure into what amounts to a single row. Uh, in this case, that the, the columns within that row are sorted first by the timestamp, well, you know, af after the, the primary key, the real primary key, <coughs> by the timestamp, and then the metric name, which is un you know, unimportant in terms of sort order, but uh, helps create that group. So on the underlying data model, this is how it would look. If, if KSAT was our resource name, then everything in, in, in that group would, would technically be stored in a single row. Now this is all abstracted away. Uh, what you get when you query it is a tabular result set like this. But this tabular result set comes from destructure, destructuring or adding structure, sorry, to this, this type of, uh, of row. So you can see the, uh, the, first <coughs> row, the first segment of this compounded key is the timestamp. This is what causes it to be sorted in time order. The second component is the, uh, is the metric name. Value indicates that this is the value column, and then the, the, you know, the actual value would be the value. So what this means is that if we look up, we look up an item by, uh, by its group um, from, a, from some time starting you know, A and some time ending B, that this is, like again, one continuous read, one sequential read across the... Uh, across the set of those columns. Um, it also means you get them all back at once. So that's why I said you have to be careful about how you group things because if, if you're only interested in you know, plotting two lines on a graph but you've constructed a group that has hundreds, you're always going to be fetching those, those hundreds of values and then, and then only using two. Uh, does that make sense? Does that make, I, this is fun that's very difficult to describe. It's, it really... It's really pretty similar to if you're familiar, you know, this primary key, this cluster key, is is actually also taken from SQL, and it really kind of works the same way. It, you know, it, uh, you know, using compounded key names or column names, it it uh, bakes structure into what it what would otherwise be a single row. Could you search just by metric name and get all the? <coughs> 
can't. Unfortunately. But that's why I say that the nature of the group is these are these are items that you expect to collect together and to retrieve together. So if that isn't what you wanted, uh, then you should flatten that uh, flatten that out and store things uh, in smaller groups that you can look up discreetly. Right. So that's how the that's how the grouping works uh, and why why it's efficient, why it makes for efficient. Um, getting back to the REST interface, writing data is a simple matter of posting the collection of those sample representations I talked about. Um, you know, you can get uh, all of those samples back out, any of those samples back out with a start and an end, and they, they come out exactly as you put them in. I mean, uh, it is possible to store samples out of order, and you'll get them back in order. Uh, but other than that, you get them out the way you the way you put them in. Uh, for measurements, there's there's something called a report or result descriptor. The the uh, these aggregations don't happen until the time you make the query. So there's there's this result descriptor, which if you're familiar with RD, uh, should look pretty pretty familiar. Uh, they allow you to do things like define that you know you want to take this you know, data sources IFN and out of, you know IF out octets and average them on you know at a resolution of one hour. Um, you know, they'll let you add them together uh, to create a, a new data source called total. They'll let you, div you know, divide them, you know, s scale the values. Um, you, you, know, you create this result descriptor. Uh, in this URL up here, the result descriptor of the report would be octets. And then you know, these raw samples are then converted into these aggregated values for you. Um, there's potentially, you know, there's there's the potential for these these queries to become, uh, you know, very latent, particularly if you have really really high frequency data and you want to graph like a year or something. But there's a lot of low hanging fruit to get that down. Um, we'll probably shard that resource like internally, we'll abstract that from the user uh, by week, you know, like on every write, add a, a prefix or suffix that denotes the week number or something, so that so that we can perform the reads uh, concurrently. Uh, I also think there's probably techniques we could use, like, um, you know, if we're building these graphs in JavaScript, and somebody's, you know, somebody's got one up on the wall board that's showing the last 24 hours, and uh, you know, you're refreshing every five minutes, you don't need to go back and get all the last, the whole last 24 hours worth of data again. You only need the last five minutes. Uh, so that's really easy to do in JavaScript. And so I think there's, there's probably techniques there that we could do to mitigate that. But uh, it is something that will need to be worked on because we are, again, prioritizing write throughput over, over reads. Uh, so <coughs> it, it will be a, a, a source of some work, I think. Um, and that's all I have in terms of slides. We've, we've set the repository public. Anybody can see it. You know, anybody can contribute to it. You know, send a pull request. Send a few, and you'll be added to the repository. We really like people to, to use this ad hoc. Uh, we'll have some integration with OpenNMS soon, I hope. Um, yeah, it would be great to get contributions, so check it out. So you mentioned the integration, so what, what's the roadmap then for the first version? Um, well, <laughs> it's, it's, it's rough because graphing and RD and graphing storage are so tightly coupled, and then they're pretty t in in OpenNMS. Everything in this in this regard is pretty tightly coupled. Uh, so it's it's you know, it's like a string of dominoes. You hit one, and you wait for them all to fall over. Uh, we'll probably start with something like you know some mean, some way of teeing you know your data collection, you know sending it in multi to multiple sinks with one being loose or or perhaps dividing <coughs> it down and sending some subclass of your data over there. And then you know, you'd, you'd be on your own for, for graphing that data or discovering that data. Uh, just to capital, you know, that would get that would get you, you know, uh, discovery and inventory uh, and then backfill graphing. And this is kind of what we're talking about. There's no firm plans. Anybody else? Anyone? Uh, so it, there's no file-based storage that's at all. It has an individual um, file 
source or whatever. So this is just going to grow and grow as a database. Yes, and we probably will have a file-based. We probably will. Um, Matt's actually back there plan back playing with that now using LevelDB as a test. LevelDB is uh, also a write-optimized database, but just a file-based one. Uh, the Chromium team wrote it for that's what Chrome uses to store data. So there probably will be a file-based one for, for simple installations that don't need a whole complexity of a Cassandra cluster set up. And uh, Cassandra has a feature called GTLs, column TTLs. So if you set the TTL at you know a year, then the first time those uh, the compaction, which is a maintenance process, occurs on columns that are older a year, they're just they're simply discarded. So you could you know set an upper bound on how long you want to keep data. Currency, if you want to get rid of or G for nodes, no longer exist. Right. Well, like I said, if, if, if you decided you wanted to. Uh, if you decided there was an upper bound on how long you wanted to keep it, you would simply set the TTL to that, and then wait. And you know, and then if you if you stop collecting data, then you have at least or at most that long to wait before it, it expires. And uh, I mean, uh, by, by the time by the time you're, you've grown to a Cassandra cluster, you're probably not worried about saving a few K here and there. You know, you probably probably be okay to wait. Dave, what's the resolution? <coughs> when the resolution you mean? Yeah, the, I think the REST interface right now uses seconds, but that should probably be changed to milliseconds since yeah. that's not really optimal <coughs> for JavaScript, and and that's you know, probably what it's going to be. Uh, Cassandra can store down store records down to the microsecond. We could make it do it that granular, but that seems yeah, it seems really excessive. So if multiple clusters post to Rings for the same resource with the same time standard, it's written twice. You mean if they store if they if they have stored the same identical collections? I guess I was thinking resource, time stamp, measurement, metric, sample or whatever. Oh if they if, if they both sort of measurement for the same time stamp. Yeah, they would all get they would all get collated under the same group in the same time stamp. So if I did a query, I would get both of two measurements yes. at the same time. Well, at the same time. however many you stored, right? Yeah. Yep. Anybody else? Christian, you look very. Can, can you add an additional keys later on? So that, that question I was asking about. Being able to discover by uh, by name, would it be possible to add additional keys in? <coughs> you mean add 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 other metrics to the to a group later on? So that so that the sort so that it's possible to retrieve using that. I mean, I'm thinking of, of a case where I'm I'm interested in finding all those that have this type of data, pulling back the data from that. May not be appropriate, but I, I, that's into a problem trying to solve. Well, I should mention too that, that we'll probably, you know, maybe as like a, as a plugin or something that can be enabled, put something in place to index the resources. Right. I think what we'll probably do is, you know, we'll come up with some delimiter, you know, the recognized delimiter of resources like a <coughs> colon or something like that, split them, and then index them as if that's meant to be, you know, hierarchical. Um, so then you would be able to search the index for, you know, if you if you put host names in the first segment of the resource, you'd be able to search, you know, go to the host name you're interested in and, and look at all of the, you know, s items with the second segment and all the ones with the third, and so forth. Um, maybe that would, maybe that's what you're talking about. So you could just, the, the point would be to discover what metrics existed, what metrics have been collected for. Yeah, that would be. Did everybody get a chance to scan the QR code? Yeah. Huh? Okay, everybody? Okay. So, Eric, do I understand, right? So, so it's <coughs> not, like a, a row is just based on time, uh, on the same time stamp. But sometimes we're collecting data, we're not precise on the same time stamp, but I guess the purpose is 
No, I, I mean a row is a row is based on the resource. Yeah. Okay. So on, on on the identifier for the group of things. So you know, like again, say MIB two interfaces for ETH zero on some host. So that would be a row. And one, that's one of the reasons why um, I say that we'll probably shard that row internally by like a weak number or something because that actually means that that without do, without doing something, every metric you ever collected for you know a given host, new two interfaces, ETH zero, would all go into that one row. The row just continues. The the a row in Cassandra and the underlying data model is a a key and a collection of ordered columns. So, uh, <coughs> parse map basically, and then this this is creating the you know like a tabular structure within that by compounded col columns. Huh? If you have more questions, just I could take it over.